morning boys and girls uh, the past seven days I've been looking for a reload and this time after the Labor Day it's not very good so everything is super cheap and I'm fighting brokers you know and I'm fighting shippers trying to find something that pays you know relatively well where I'm not just spending money on permits and, and fuel and uh, financing fees for my equipment and I thought I would take this time and talk about something that often comes up in comments at least it used to where people were asking me about you know rates but it's kind of like useless telling you um, the exact rates because uh, every market is different and um, you know I'm in Canada right so I don't do loads inside US I only do loads between mostly Ontario Canada and the States and back and occasionally I do loads inside inside Canada so that's what I'm allowed to do right and so my market is totally different it's everything pretty much goes across the border and so the rates maybe are a bit higher than inside US because there's more expenses in all these bridge fees uh, you have to be registered for to work with customs you know it's much more headaches and so it's it should pay better but I thought I would just instead of giving you guys uh, you know the fish I will tell you how to fish I will tell you how I come up with um, the rates and I gotta thank a guy who does who didn't want to be named he's a freight broker in Alberta and mostly it's like two two side strategy right at determining your rate and this guy was uh, kind enough to supply me um, with some tips of what they use over there and specifically in oil fields of Western Canada people often use hourly rate okay whereas uh, in other parts of US and Canada that's not so common but definitely um, I always double check based on his advice I often double check uh, a rate per mile that I came up with versus time involved you know and first of all you never should start with something that you know you think the guy would expect you to expect you to the guy or the girl will expect a rate or something you always have to think about yourself first and you have to know your costs you know where you have to be in order to to survive and stay profitable right uh, and specifically you can never start with let's say two dollars and then go up to five dollars you know it's always better to start with twenty dollars and then go down to three dollars so basically you always start as high as possible and you don't pay attention to to uh, sarcasm or jokes you know and you keep um, you keep all emotions out of your communication communications with uh, brokers because it's I cannot tell you how many times it happened where a guy would start making fun of me and then eventually he'll call me and say okay uh, are you still available and so wait and you know and I want to say wait like didn't you just make fun of me at my and you were saying that my rate was crazy and now you you okay with that because you know quite often these guys they don't understand you know like oh it's only 200 miles yeah but first of all it's 200 miles between two inside you know you you go across the border right and then you want me to bring back the trailer and then you, you want me to drive 200 miles in the opposite way so now wait a second so now it's not 200 miles now it's 600 miles well yeah but no but you know so anyway what I do is like method number one not method but the tip I would say the tip number one is uh, you have to determine your hourly rate 
right and I read a bunch of books about this when I was trying to start a computer repair business a long time ago and even like you know any kind of consultant business and there's a bunch of books on the market and then tell you how you come up with your with your fee structure right and I remember one particular method uh, that made me very happy was you start from what you what you want you know you look at your expenses let's say you know let's say you're self-employed right and so you look at all your expenses you know let's say like what's the lifestyle you want to lead you know uh, what kind of car you want to drive you know the mortgage your car payments and then you add everything together and and then you know your your professional fees you know your equipment fees like if you're a trucker right what kind of truck you want to drive and then you add the uh, healthy profit like how much you want to make like you know real money so you want to make 30,000 a year 50,000 a year you know like in your pocket right 60,000 like what would you what would make you happy right and then you just you go very conservative with um, with months and weeks like instead of 12 months you use 11 let's say you divide let's say you came up with for some reason you decided you want 1 million dollars right so a year gross that covers all your all your costs your profits you know payments to your to your uh, to your uh, fifth wife you know stuff like that so you you include everything but then you divide you don't divide by 12 months you divide by 11 right you go very conservative first of all because there's n n never you never work the entire 12 months right so you divide by 11 then you divide by four weeks in a month instead of let's say 4.5 or something right and then you use like you come up with something realistic like what's gonna be your billable hours a week you know like it cannot be 40 or 50 right so like very conservative let's say 20 right and so let's say in this case you divide 1 million by 11 months by four weeks by 20 right and that's your that's your rate and so and so basically yeah so when you see a load first of all you start high but you know you have to have an idea where you start high right and generally speaking so of course the more the heavier the load the bigger the load you know the more permits it requires so the more money you, you're trying to get from the broker right but the easiest way like for me why i like heavy haul is because it's usually easy with axles right you go by how many axles are required like if it's a six axle load seven axle load right ten axle load and the more axles you need for the load the more money you ask them for right but quite often quite often there's a, a long deadhead right like for example now I was uh, talking to a guy who didn't want to pay and actually eventually they moved that load because I see it disappeared but it was okay hundred miles from me on the US side and then it goes to Nova Scotia like the very end of Nova Scotia, pretty much where the you uh, you you bought the ferry to go to Newfoundland, you know, like the very end, and that's about 1,200 miles, you know. And the guy was the load was heavy, but the rate was you know pretty much like 50% of what I would want to have, and this guy just couldn't understand why. I said, well, it's Nova Scotia at the end of the world. I said, the only, the only um, loads that go out of there, it's peat moss, right? Uh, I do, I have an RGN trailer. Like, what am I supposed to, where am I supposed to load that peat moss? You want me to hold pe <laughs> peat moss on my trailer? Um, and he says, well, actually, I found the guy, uh, but he cannot do it until later like until one week later and we were trying to and that's the the rate he agreed on uh, we agreed on uh, but now I'm trying to move it you know faster so basically wait a second so you found a guy but now you want to move it faster you still want to pay the same money you know which does not make sense right so either you want to move it you know kind of like expedite fashion fashion right so then you have to pay people more right and quite often you know these brokers they just they play all these games but basically 
what I'm trying to say is that if you expect a loan debt head, you have to factor that in in your rate because the other guy, let's say you deliver this, let's say I take this load. Some guy's playing a guitar. Uh, hold on, let's close that window. I don't want to have any copyright issues. Um, and so, um, let's say I go to the end of the world to do this uh, Nova Scotia load, right? Let's say I agree to this guy rate. Um, and then I'm sitting there and realistically speaking, when you're so far over there, uh, the... It's getting very hot. But it's noisy. There's a, a road behind me there. Um, but anyway, so then it's like, I don't know, 800 miles, 700 miles to Montreal. That's the nearest place where you can find a load. Even though for me, I never can find loads out of there. It's all mafia, all local guys, you know. I don't know. I, I never, like very rarely, I, I, I'm lucky and I can find a load. But anyway, so if I don't charge this guy for this dead head, right, to Montreal, uh, and then let's say there is a load there, right, and I'm sitting in, in this Nova Scotia, 800 miles away, and if I try to mention this to that next load in Montreal, let's say, right, the broker will never pay for this 800 miles because you know they never that's not his problem right he has a load from montreal let's say to laredo texas and if you if you if you are interested in this load but you are near the ocean in nova scotia that's not his problem right and because of this it's extremely important to always factor the dead head in your rate with the previous load so in this case like this load from batavia new york to the nova scotia right i have to add that 800 miles you know let's say i'm not even gonna charge him for this you know 150 miles from cambridge ontario to batavia because that's just nothing but from nova scotia to montreal you see the next guy will never pay me that money you know and so you cannot just give me you know couple of bucks per mile for this 1200 miles because realistically it's not 1200 miles it's it's 2000 miles because I have to go to Batavia take this load deliver to Nova Scotia and then bring it back to Mon and then go empty to Montreal so it's all because of this load right I'm not driving in through New Brunswick and Nova Scotia because I feel like you know doing some sightseeing I'm driving because of that load you know and so that's one strategy that I learned is that it's always uh, factor the that distance, you know, to the next load. Because quite often, this happens all the time, you know, like you will see a load, uh, I don't know, Toronto to Alaska, right? Like, okay, Alaska, I'm pretty sure they already know that, you know, Alaska, unless you some kind of a local guy who always has has loads out of there, you have loads out of there but they have to pay for you to get back i don't know to edmonton alberta you know and so yeah so you start high and you factor all these expenses and you use your uh, you use your you know uh, dollars per mile but then you double check by the hours you know so here's what this guy from alberta taught me so what we do is you measure the distance let's say let's take let's continue with this no i'm just dying here it's so hot i close that window um so let's say we continue with this example so let's say i give the guy a break i don't charge for the dead head to from cambridge ontario to batavia to the shipper and then but then i add you know 1200 miles not sure wait a second if it's by the hour you have to take everything because this is your time yeah forget it um, so basically I count all the miles from Cambridge Ontario to Batavia to the delivery in Nova Scotia and then to Montreal like the closest point where I can find a reload right and let's say it's 2,000 miles so that what I do after that I take um, I take 2,000 
right? And um, hold on, somebody sent me a text message over here. So 2,000, and I divide, I divide by very conservative uh, speed, let's say 50 miles per hour. You know, because when you're in a truck, there's always construction. You stop. You know, there's um, if you go through town, there's lights, right? So you cannot use like 60 or 65 or 70. So you you go very conservative. So 50. So 2,000 divided by 50 is 40, right? And then in my case, because everything goes across the border, I add uh, one hour for uh, border crossing and then two hours for loading plus two hours for unloading. So basically I always add five hours uh, So two for loading two for unloading one for for the For the border crossing and so we come up with this little number here 45 right so that's 45 hours and that's of course that's non stopping at 50 miles per hour You know, but that's roughly what will cost me in terms of time to go from you know, Cambridge to Batavia, load, cross the border, go to Nova Scotia, unload, and go to Montreal, right? And then you just apply that that hourly rate. And the way I do it, I have uh, like one high rate for big heavy loads, right? And then I have a medium rate for something that's not too big and too heavy, right? And And then basically, that's the hourly calculation and then I compare that with the mile you know dollar per mile dollar per mile method hello Sergey <sighs> yeah sorry about that the guy was asking me if if I can do load design US I said no but anyway so yeah so uh, so you verify your a rate per mile with your hourly calculation you know and usually if you do everything right they should be pretty close you know uh, and a couple more tricks uh, anything under 500 miles uh, especially for for us Canadians you know let's say there's a load there was a load, uh, like something was pretty heavy, I, I forgot, 85,000 pounds, some kind of a crane or something, going into Michigan, right? And the guy didn't want to pay because it was only, quote unquote, I forgot, 250 miles or something like that. But what am I supposed to do in Michigan? You know, again, because I'm Canadian, we cannot do loads inside the US, right? I have to find a load across the border. And so the rule that I'm using, um, Again, based on the advice I got from this gentleman in Alberta, the broker is that if it's less than 500 miles, you gotta charge people double because you have to return home most of the time. You have to return empty, right? In this case, so it's 250 miles uh, across the border, and I'm in a foreign country, so I have to charge them to come back. So it's not 250 miles; it's 500 miles, right? And then you use that hourly rate and mile mile per you know dollar per mile rate um, to check check them against each other right and of course that guy was screaming it oh it's only 250 miles you know um, but you know you gotta be ready for negative uh, response because of course brokers trying to make money for themselves they're not trying to make money for you so if if the customer if the customer gave them I don't know ten thousand dollars and you're asking for 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 seven thousand dollars they're gonna be very unhappy because they're only making three thousand dollars on you you know but they will tell you that we don't have that much in this load so you cannot trust you know Quite often, you cannot trust uh, what brokers tell you about the rate. Uh, but one thing I wanted to say, something very important. Never shoot yourself in the foot, you know? Because quite, quite often, I was offered a rate that I would never ask, ask for. 
you know like only because I kept my mouth shut somebody says well how about this this is what we paid before are you okay with this and they'll give me a rate which is like two times more than I would I would have asked them for you know <laughs> so so very important tip if at all possible always try to get the broker to give you the rate you know just see what the budget is you know like what are they thinking because maybe his budget is 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 pretty good you know um, so this definitely happened to me you know uh, more than once more than once when I was quite surprised but the rate I was offered you know um, and this specifically happens with um, uh, heavy loads and that's why I'm going into I just like the it's a bit more simple to uh, to agree on a rate when you have a heavy load because there's much less competition, right? And that's why I'm going into this multi-axle business, right? I'm getting a Jeep and Stinger, hopefully, by the end of the year. Because I do see these loads, you know, like 105,000 pounds, 110,000 pounds, 115,000 pounds, you know. I just saw, I think, what, 135, which is definitely out of my reach. Um, but it does not mean that heavy loads automatically pay a lot of money because quite often, you know, um, the customer will not realize how many expenses are involved that you need, uh, you know, you need to have, uh, you know, escorts and permits can take forever, right? So you don't want to be too heavy. So I definitely don't want to do like 12 or 13 axle stuff. Even though I know I, I in the beginning my goal was uh, seven axles. Four axle truck, three axle trailer. And then I got sucked in into this eight axles. And now I'm thinking of adding a tandem Jeep, you know. <laughs> but then eventually there comes a point where, you know, you're always a super load. And so permits take a very long time. And then, you know, you're losing time, right? So. Even though you're making, I don't know, a million dollars a month, but you're sitting on your butt, you know, like, what's the point? Uh, but yeah, like I said, very important, don't be the first to, uh, to, uh, to name the price, if possible, you know, the guy will, if the guy can give you a good price, just let him tell you the price. And another psychological trick is that you will always make more money when brokers are calling you instead of you calling brokers, you know. And so it doesn't work often in my case again because I'm in Canada. But if you can post your truck, right? You post your truck as available, and then people call you. Then you kind of like can ask for more money because clearly they need you, right? They need your truck, right? Uh, they they're not gonna call you and say, hey, you know, oh, we're gonna give you like two bucks a mile, you know, to move a hundred thousand dollar, hundred thousand pound excavator. It's not gonna work like that because if they're calling and looking for people, that means that they have some, you know, budget. They or they are in a, in a rush. And by the by the way, being in a rush, that's another cool thing for a heavy hauler because if they need to ship something urgently they will pay more money okay and quite often the worst the worst loads are loads where the customer is not in a rush and so you see a load where it's like the rate is kind of like ridiculous and you call them and the guy says again this happened to me the guy says well i understand it's cheap but he says that's what the customer wants to ship it at uh and he's not in a rush you know and so they would put the cheap price because let's say it goes on a sh on a ship right the guy sold some kind of equipment overseas but the ship uh, the load is ready but the ship is only coming in I don't know in four weeks right and so they put the load on the board you know for like hundred thousand pounds and they put like thousand bucks rate you know on on let's say 500 miles I'm just you know giving you an example and and they're just looking for some people that are willing to move it for that price because there's always somebody that's I don't know trying to get home or you know or they are from that area I don't know so eventually they can move it you know 
So there's no, and one last thing I want to say is that there's no formula. There's no formula where you can say, hey, like, why are you paying so little? Uh, it's supposed to be this, you know? There's no formula, uh, kind of like, you know, math or algebra, right? Where you say, well, this is what it should be, right? No, because it's all about people. It's about how well you can uh, negotiate, you know? And I would say that's the most important thing for the heavy hauler to do, to be able to do is to, is uh, not to be afraid to ask for a lot of money. And you have to know how to negotiate, you know, because it's all, it's all sales. It's all sales. Quite often it doesn't matter what kind of equipment you have because, you know, you can make a killing with a dry van if you're a good salesman, right? So that's the most important thing. Uh, because again, I, I I suspect there's a bunch of guys that you know went into this heavy whole thing, maybe even based on on my videos, right? And then they're sitting, they're sitting somewhere, and they're surprised at why nobody is is uh, throwing money at them. Because you know, it's all kind of like you know cutthroat business. Brokers want want to make money. Customers wanna wanna save money, and then truckers wanna wanna make money, right? But it's not possible where everybody makes money, right? So somebody loses, right? So it's all about leverage, you know. Like, do they want to ship it fast, you know? Um, do they want good equipment, or maybe they're okay with the guy using a 50-year-old truck and you know, 20-year-old trailer? Uh, actually, most of the time. I find that they don't care what your equipment looks like. If it's like five, ten years old, they don't care. Uh, but some people do care, you know. If especially if it's some kind of a expensive product, some expensive machine, like brand new, and it goes to the customer, you know, sometimes they would be kind of like sensitive about your equipment. But thankfully, you know, my truck is pretty much new, right? The trail is pretty much new. Um, but I thought those are the tips that I thought I would give you guys without telling you the exact number because that's just again that's useless because each area is different and again I'm in Canada right so it's its own specifics over here but of late that hourly method has become my favorite you know because you can quite often you can come up with a pretty decent number which is fair you know because you go by the by the time you need to invest into this and you just try to take into account you know everything like the deadhead the um, you know um, the the move to the next load to the area where you can find the next load you know and then you take into account your you know like in my case your border crossing loading and loading and um, one last thing I wanted to mention, somebody asked me on, in comments on YouTube about uh, detention. Now, detention, because of course the goal is to get as much money as you, as you can from the broker in the very beginning, right? So it's not like it's a dry van, right? Where people pay a very low price and of course then they okay giving you detention. But because you always try to negotiate maximum price, then quite often nobody will pay you more money you know and detention there is detention and there is detention like uh, um, a few weeks ago i was sitting where in kentucky for like three or four days because the permits uh, the, the the permit department of that state was uh, swamped and they didn't have enough people so they were very slow and so that's not detention right so something that's uh, you know not the fault of the shipper they're never gonna pay you money for that you know like uh, permits or you're sitting at the bridge let's say you come to a bridge what happened to me um, I had the oversized load and I didn't check and turns out that particular bridge you can only cross I forgot Monday through Wednesday you know 7 to 9 in the morning and 4 to 6 in the evening something crazy like that and I was there like Thursday, you know, and so I had to sit there till Monday. But even then, that guy, I still remember, that guy uh, paid me a few hundred bucks 
uh, even though I didn't ask him, but he says, oh, now you're going to ask me for detention. Uh, even though, you know, you, one could argue that it was my fault, right? So I didn't research this, but I mean, how am I supposed, I cannot know everything, right? So how am I supposed to know that that particular bridge was under construction? It was so severely limited in, uh, in uh, you know, truck traffic. They were limiting truck traffic. But that guy, you know, was a nice gentleman and he gave me a couple hundred bucks and he paid for the hotel. And he gave me, I think, I forgot, like 50, 100 bucks, he says, for the restaurant, you know. So sometimes people will actually surprise you, you know. But, um, um, so speaking about detention, yeah, so they will pay for detention most of the time. What's understood as detention is when it's the fault of the customer. So let's say um, they tell you it's 8 o'clock loading, you go there and there's no crane, right? let's say if it's a it's a crane appointment so the crane is late or the crane broke down or something and you sit there like what happened to me uh, where in Delaware I went there and I had to sit there for two days because they were still waiting for parts and they were they were still working at that machine like putting parts on it so it was not my fault right so it was their fault and so I think they, I forgot how much they paid me, but they, they did pay me detention. But basically, you know, it's, you don't have to specify that. Like when you get the rate confirmation, most of the time, you know, it's, um, it's understood that if something like that happens when it's a fault of the customer or the shipper, you know, like, or the, uh, you're about to deliver and the consignee says, well, actually, we don't have room in here uh, this construction site uh, we need to let that sit on your trailer for three days you know again happened to me so and I, I ask him for money you know like if you're gonna use my trailer as a storage facility you have to pay me right because we didn't agree on this the, the we agreed on picking up the load and delivering but now the guy says well it's a very busy construction area and you cannot unload until next Thursday and I'm like, I'm sorry. So like, what am I supposed to do? I only have one truck, one trailer, right? And so you have to, you know, talk to them. But again, it's all about communication, about what kind of a salesman you are, you know? So sales, I would say, is the most important uh, quality to be able to sell, uh, sell your rate, you know, uh, for a heavy hauler, specifically for a heavy hauler, you know? And yeah, that's why I, I don't do cheap loads, you know, uh, what helps is that I'm a very small company, it's only me, I'm the president, I'm the janitor, I'm the wardrobe security, and I can afford to sit and wait, as long as I do like three, four loads a month, I'm okay, you know, I just need to find a good load, but I hate to do cheap loads, where the only person who makes money is the broker, you know. So those are some tips that I hope would uh, help you guys. Those are those guys that are doing heavy haul and those guys that are thinking about doing heavy haul. So maybe you, some of this info would be useful. So thanks for watching. Captain Sergey out.